Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be presenting our work on directive synthesis of failing concurrent executions. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Omar Trip and Murli Krishna Ramnathan. So, multi-threaded libraries are useful for numerous reasons. The two key reasons are these. First, first of all, they provide safety guarantees under concurrency, and also pro provide uh, performance benefits and guarantees about them. This implies from the point of view of a third party application developer who is uh, using this library, he need not uh, trouble himself with the intricacies of uh, concurrency or worry whether this uh, library is going to be some sort of a performance bottleneck. While it is amazing to have such libraries, uh, developing such libraries is actually a challenging task. Now let's look at the story of what it would seem from the point of view of a library developer. Here we have a developer who is trying to construct a class. So while he's doing this, he has to think about a lot of uh, aspects that he has to, challenges he has to address. First of all, he has to ensure that the library works as it expected, that delivers the functionality it is supposed to provide to the user. It should uh, work well when it is used in a multi-threaded context. That means it is not going to uh, limit the amount of concurrency the application can extract. And also, since we are designing a multi-threaded library, we would like it to be the case that it is actually free from all concurrency-related bugs, that is, no deadlocks, data races, or atomicity violation. In addition, uh, there are other properties maybe that he has to satisfy, such as modularity, good design of data structures, so on and so forth. So, while attempting to tackle all these concerns, it is quite conceivable that the developer might break one or more such guarantees that are made by the library. In such a case, it is a common practice to add numerous asserts into the system to ensure there is modular testing. It is a good practice to add such asserts into the system, but what we have here is a library, so there is more work that has to be done. So a library cannot start itself, so he also has to come up with a client that continuously interacts with, the, uh, with this class and executes the code that we are testing, basically. So what should this client look like? Uh, this client is supposed to invoke all the public APIs that are provided by the library, and if at all there is a problem in the library, it has to be capable enough uh, to reveal it to the user who is testing it. Such a client, if we can build such a client, is quite useful and can be added to a regression test suite, maybe for future use. So what we just said, the client that we just Is it going to be 100, 200? What is the total number of threads we are going to have? And what are these threads going to do? Uh, what are the methods that are going to be invoked by each of these threads? In addition, also identify what kind of parameters are we going to provide to each such invocation? What amount of sharing is going to uh, take place between uh, multiple threads? Once we have designed such a client, we also have to come up with a good set of schedules that have to be explored uh, for us to be able to reveal uh, various uh, behaviors of the class that we are testing here. This is a lot to do. We now expect the developer to not only write the code, but we are asking him to write more code to test the code that was originally written. So instead, it would be great if we could just expect the developer to do what he is supposed to do, and that is develop the class that he has promised. And we provide this as a input, so some black box, which takes this class and provides a client which meets all the specifications that we just discussed about. This would reduce the burden from the developer quite a bit. And this is, uh, this is what we would like to do. Uh, there has been some work in this area, and uh, most notably, 
It was uh, Pradel and Gross, uh, who is the session chair here, who proposed a randomized technique to uh, generate such clients in an automated manner. Uh, what they were looking for is crashes and deadlocks hidden in a library, so that uh, uh, hidden in the library. In addition, uh, we in the recent years even we have worked in this area, and uh, uh, we have come up with targeted client synthesis techniques, uh, which when uh, which when synthesized will then be input to a dynamic analysis engine. So this engine itself can be anything. It could be fast track, race fuzzer, deadlock fuzzer, any dynamic uh, defect detection engine that we have, concurrent defect detection engine. And from these, we would be able to get deadlocks, data races, and atomicity violations that were hidden in the library. So in this, we miss the key aspect. What we, to this day, don't have is a targeted technique that will generate clients to reveal crashes that are hidden in the library. So this is the problem that we are going to look at in this work. And so what we want is to be able to detect crashes that are hidden in the library. If we want to do this, we want a technique that will design a good multi-threaded client, which will reveal this, and also come up with a scheduling that has to be followed for the uh, assertion to fail. So to do this, we propose Minion. What does Minion do? So Minion takes as input a class that we would like to test and uh, an assert that has been added by the developer which you would like to test whether it can be failed or not. In addition, uh, it also takes a random sequential client. This client makes random invocation into the public APIs that are defined by the library with random parameters. We do not care what parameters are provided at this point. So once such a random client is given, this could be written by the developer or be generated by automated uh, tools such as random also. So once this input is given, uh, Minion will go ahead and synthesize a multi-threaded client that meets all the requirements and is capable of uh, revealing the assertion violation. And it also outputs the thread interleaving that has to be followed by this client. If we were to enforce this thread interleaving on this client, we will be able to uh, witness the crash. So let's understand the intricacies of, uh, that has to be handled by Minion a little further. We are looking at a class pushback reader, which is from JDK 8. We are only looking at one method, and we are going to examine this method uh, in a little bit detail. In this line, we see that uh, there is an invocation of system array copy. So we are copying data from one buffer to another. The assumption here is that the destination buffer where we are copying data to cannot be null, or it will cause a null pointer exception. And the developer has not expected this because he has only declared an IO exception here. So this is not a behavior we would like to have. So somehow, the developer has implicitly asserted that this field cannot be null. Further, this is not the only invocation to buff we have. In uh, hun line 118, which precedes this, there is another dereference to the same uh, object, that, uh, same field, that is buff, where we are uh, dereferencing it. That also means that we cannot have it be null here either. So we have two asserts in the system. Let's say that we want to fail the second one. If we want to fail this assert, we have to ensure that the first assert actually holds. Because we do not want the execution to crash here, and we want it to make progress and identify whether this can be crashed in this particular location. If we want to crash, if we want this to crash here, that means that somehow the value of buffer that is being read by the first assert is not null and is somehow made null from the time the first assert evaluated to the time the second assertion evaluated. This obviously cannot done in a sequential setup. So that means that we need a, some other thread which is capable of writing a null in between these two asserts. There is more to this problem here. So before the second assert is reached, we see a nested path condition here. There are two conditionals, 119 and 120. Among these, we it is necessary for us to evaluate the first condition to true. If this condition is not evaluated true, the assert will not even be reachable. But we don't really care what happens with the second condition, whether it is true or false, I'll still be able to reach the assert assert that is of interest to me. And what we are dealing here is a concurrent library, so the developer has obviously added 
uh, number of locks in the system and uh, any client that hopes to violate this assertion needs to tackle this as well. So is this even, assert can even be failed? And the answer is yes, uh, that's why I'm discussing. But the, the client that needs to be generated to uh, fail this assert is quite complicated. Uh, here we have three threads, thread T1, T2, and T3, each of which is invoking different, different APIs. One invokes close, the other is expected to invoke read. That is where the assertion is hidden. And the third is expected to uh, invoke unread. And there is a specific interleaving that has to be followed, not to mention it, the parameters that are provided are also appropriately set. If we do all these things, the, there's going to be a null pointer exception in the location that we were looking at. This defect actually was uh, reported to the Oracle developers on version eight, and it has now been fixed in version nine. So what is it that we want? So we have uh, a random execution that is going to be provided to the minion engine. So that is actually maybe diverging quite away from the execution. And somehow we would like to synthesize an execution where it not only reaches the assertion, but it also fails it. So in order to reach it, it has to ensure that the path condition C1, C2, C3 maybe need to be evaluated appropriately. And this is quite possible that was not satisfiable under sequential setup. So what we require may be a multi-threaded client, let's say where uh, there is predetermined number of threads that are already spun with appropriate invocations and parameters already set, and we come up with some sort of an interleaving that is already known, which will ensure that the asset is actually reachable. This is our goal. So this is an iterative approach we are going to propose. So we are going to take a look at the overall approach overview here. Each iteration in Minion will do the following things. First, it will have a static analysis, which will take the current client that we have and identify the as such, uh, a specific set of targets. In each iteration, it will identify a target. A target is going to be an assertion we would like to violate, or it could be an update to a field. Why do we consider an update to a field uh, will be obvious in the future slides. It's obvious that we want to identify an assertion but uh, details about this will be obvious in future slides. So once we have identified what is going to be our target, it will also go ahead and propose a plan to reach this uh, target. Next comes the dynamic analysis, which is going to take the current client that we have and execute it. While it is executing, it is also going to collect some data. So it is going to collect uh, what was the path conditions that was traversed, what were the assignments that we witnessed, or what were the values of different, different fields, all these data will be con uh, collected by the dynamic analysis. And then we call the constraint solver. We encode the execution uh, of the dynamic analysis as constraints. Uh, as before, we have read write constraints, path constraints, lock constraint, and so on and so forth. We are not really going to look into the details of it. Uh, but these constraints are actually uh, generated using the data that was provided by dynamic analysis and as was advised by the static analysis. So this will constraint will then be obviously evaluated and what we receive as a solution is going to be a structure of the client that we would like to synthesize in the, for the next iteration and the schedule that has to be followed for the next iteration. So we repeat this process until we hit our target. So let's look at it in a little bit detail. So we have here, uh, the first iteration, what we have is a uh, random sequential client. Static analysis knows that there are three uh, public APIs, each of which probably can take multiple different paths. Uh, so among this, what we said is static analysis is going to identify the location of the first target and also propose the plan to reach this. So here it has said that ensure C1, C2, C3 evaluates as shown in this figure. But now comes the dynamic analysis, but what we gave it is a random client. So it is going to execute random paths. So in this case, it has actually completely diverged away from the assert, even in the first condition, and has moved towards some other code. So the, this execution obviously did not crash. The reason is that it did not, uh, did not comply to the plan that was proposed by the static analysis. So we say that we now know that this C1, which was the problem, has to be now flipped. This is a problematic condition currently we have, so we are attempting to uh, flip it. 
So what we will do is we take this execution uh, where thread T1 invokes uh, M1, M2, and M3 and encode this. Encode all the uh, encode the execution of each of these and treat as though they are being invoked from different different threads. And uh, there is more detail to it and uh, how these constraints are generated. The details are in the paper and I'll not be getting into the details here. So in addition to uh, encoding this path, we are also going to require that condition C1 be negated. We are come up with this constraint, and once this constraint is generated, is going we are going to invo uh, invoke the SMP solver, and uh, SMP solver is now going to consume these constraints, and it might say it is satisfiable or not. Let's say in this iteration it was satisfiable, and it gave us a uh, client and the plan that has to be followed for this particular client. And we have the next iteration here. We maybe have a new client where we have the same method invocation, but maybe the parameters are appropriately set somehow. There are two threads now, T1 and T2. And uh, T2 invokes M2 followed by M3. And the, the schedule that is proposed by uh, the solver might look something like this. What this telling us is C1, for us to, evaluate, uh, for us to negate C1, we have to read some intermediate value that was written by M2. So it has to read a value which was uh, which happened between these two nodes. So if we take this current line and enforce this, it will ensure that we make forward progress. But this may not be the end of it. It might still diverge away from where we want to be at C2. In this case, we are back to square one where we were in the last iteration, only we have made a little bit further progress. Now we do the same thing. We want to be able to negate C2. So to negate it, we generate constraints for the this path that we saw, uh, we just witnessed. I'm going to ask this to be negated. So we provide, we invoke the solver again, and it is quite possible that the solver might say this cannot be done. So at this time, we are stuck. The engine does not know what to do, and uh, there is no way for us to make progress. So. This is where we take the help of static analysis again. Notice that what does it mean for us to say C2 cannot be negated? We just encoded the execution we just witnessed. But maybe there is still hope. Maybe static analysis can come up with different targets that might help us uh, to negate this one. There are a lot of paths in M2 and in M3 that are not yet explored. Here may be hidden an update to some field that, would, uh, that can actually uh, influence C2. So we do just that. In this iteration, we say this is the client and uh, static analysis is now invoked. It knows that C2 is the one that needs to be flipped. It is going to go through the code and identify a new target. This target can be an update, and it, it is also going to propose a plan to reach this new target. So we now have two targets, the old target that we have and the new target that was just defined. And we are now going to focus on our new target and keep the old target aside for a while. And this means that we have a new plan, new target, so we start minion once again. Maybe after few iterations and few attempts, maybe let's say that minion was actually able to come up with an execution where that path was witnessed. So now that the uh, newly generated target is somehow satisfied, we encode the execution and uh, move back uh, and focus our energy on the older target. And we ask again whether it is possible to flip condition C2 this time, now that there, are new, there is a new path in the game. So this constraint will then be given to solver, and solver might say yes, it can be done, and propose a new client and a schedule. With this new client and the new schedule uh, that is proposed, if we enforce it, the execution will make further progress and maybe crash the execution. So we have implemented a minion on uh, top of a suit bytecode analysis uh, framework, and uh, it extensively uses uh, Z3 constraint solving, uh, constraint solver for all its uh, constraint solving purposes. And uh, also, uh, minion was evaluated uh, for its effectiveness on open source uh, Java library. And as an input, as we said, we need a random sequential uh, uh, client. Uh, we ro uh, manually wrote test cases, which would invoke all the APIs in a class with the random parameters, and whatever parameters we could think of. 
and uh, provided this as an input to Minion. These were the classes that we looked at uh, to uh, evaluate uh, Minion. Uh, we took classes from Cash 4J to JDK, and we have almost always tried to work with the latest version of uh, these code bases. And the total number of uh, public methods that were available ranged from 3 to 50, actually. So with 50 different public APIs, you can imagine how complicated a test case or how complicated it is to manually identify whether something can fail or not. Uh, and here are the results. So there was minimum, each class defined as two targets because we were just looking at one target, but it is not necessary that a class has just one assert. So some uh, minimum number of uh, assert assertions that we saw was two and maximum was 23. But together, uh, all these classes gave us around 80 assertions. And uh, it led to the total number of constraints being around 56,000. Uh, and uh, the time it took to provide a decision on uh, uh, for all these 10 classes put together is around 23 minutes. And it said that uh, 31 uh, of the defects from these 80 are actually a problem. It was only uh, could be violated in a, a concurrent setup. And it also went ahead and failed uh, in 23 more locations, but it was reachable sequentially, so we do not really think of it as a problem. These uh, 23 uh, assertions were mostly like uh, uh, constraints that was added by the developer for the cleanliness. And what uh, is the characteristics of the bugs that we looked at? How complex are they? That is what we are looking, going to look at in this slide. Uh, we identify how complex the bug is based on three criteria. First is how far away is the uh, defect? So how many, uh, what is the total, uh, the length of the stack that had to be met for the assertion to fail? That is the first thing. And second, we are going to see how many iterations it took to reach the target that we were looking at. And third, how many nested path conditions we had to reach the asset and fail it. So the maximum that we witnessed was around 11. Uh, the maximum uh, 11 was the uh, condition uh, nesting that we saw. And the maximum stack depth was around 6. And the total number of iterations it took maximum was around 3. So in summary, we have uh, designed a directed uh, approach for synthesizing crashing executions. And we have tested it on tell well-tested uh, popular Java classes. And the crashes that we detected, we have reported it to the developers, and some of them have been already fixed. And uh, the total time taken is around 23 minutes, which we think is pretty reasonable.